All right, I'm turning my camera off in three, two, one. Hello and welcome to the webinar um, on Nashville's Policy Academy on, uh, on Mental Health Crisis Services. Your lines will be muted during the webinar. To ask a question or make a comment, please use the Q&A function and the chat will also be available. Uh, please complete the evaluation in the pop-up after the webinar to help us continue to improve your experience. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kitty Purrington, and welcome to this Nashby webinar on rural mental health crisis services. <clears throat> Excuse me. Today, we will be talking about an upcoming Nashby learning opportunity for mental health crisis services, particularly in rural areas. And we are also going to be hearing from officials at both HRSA and SAMHSA to learn more about priorities and opportunities from those federal partners. <laughs> This learning opportunity and webinar are funded through the National Organizations of State and Local Officials Program, which is a HRSA cooperative agreement. Next slide, please. Before we get started, just a few words about the National Academy for State Health Policy. We are a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization. We were formed um, over 30 years ago, and our mission uh, is to support state health policymakers in their work to improve state health policy. We work with leaders across the country in Medicaid, in behavioral health, on coverage issues, maternal child health, and a range of other um, state health policy issues. Essentially, our core function is to really facilitate discussion among state, state leaders and um, uh, provide opportunities for them to learn from each other. Next slide, please. On the call today, I have my Nashby colleagues, Jody Manns, who you will be hearing from a bit later, Eliza Meta, and Mia Antezzo, and together we are the team for this project. Next slide, please. Before I turn things over to Dr. Fisher and Dr. Smith, I just wanted to note the importance and the timeliness of the discussion today. Um, we know that rates of mental illness are already, were already increasing prior to COVID, um, the COVID pandemic in the past 15 months, and that these disorders have been exacerbated by the pandemic. These issues can be particularly challenging in rural areas, areas where we know there is an older population, there are fewer resources, and also more barriers to accessing care. So we are really excited to have representatives from HRSA and SAMHSA talk about their agency's respective priorities and opportunities in this area. Following that discussion, we'll hear from Jody Manns from Nashby, who will talk us through the opportunity that we are um, supporting that will bring states together to talk about these issues. And um, after that, we will have an opportunity for uh, questions if you, if, you, if you have any. So I'm uh, now gonna turn it over to Sylvia Fisher, who is the Director of the Office of Research and Evaluation within HRSA. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kitty. And it's a very great pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, it's an honor to represent HRSA on this important initiative and our various behavioral health activities. Next slide, please. I'd like to give you a sense of what we are addressing in HRSA, what populations we serve, and what we, what programs we need to uh, As you know, or may know, the Health Resources and Services Administration is an agency in the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. We're primarily uh, the federal agency for, you know, improving health care for people who are geographically isolated, economically, or medically vulnerable. And there are, of course, millions of individuals who are served by HRSA annually. We have over 3,000 grantees and over 90 programs. Uh, we have a lot of core programs that are focused on providing high quality primary health care. And then we also serve various populations, pregnant women and mothers, individuals with HIV and AIDS, among and many others. We also train health professionals and try and get them distributed to areas where there are underserved populations and improvements are needed in healthcare delivery. On top of that, we do other work that you can see listed here. Next, please. Our vision is healthy communities and healthy people. Our mission is to improve health outcomes, achieve health equity through access to quality services, to ensure a skilled health workforce is available to underserved populations and to promote and continue to maintain innovative high value programs. 
And as you can see, those goals are reflected, uh, reflective of our larger mission. Thank you. Next. Okay, so according to, you know, we'll, you know, we'll hear some statistics from uh, me, but you'll know, mostly hear some very uh, recent uh, upcoming statistics about SAMHSA, from SAMHSA in a little while, but um, we have information to know from the survey, the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, which is a SAMHSA survey, that roughly 7.3 million non-metropolitan adults have reported having a mental illness of some type in 2019, accounting for over a fifth of individuals who are in non-metropolitan areas. Uh, of these, almost 5% have reported that they have thought about suicide seriously within a, the past year. I remind you, this is 2019 data, not the most recent, but a good pre-pandemic figure to look at. Uh, next, please. Given that there are similar rates of uh, suicidality, suicidal thinking, uh, and um, considerations about perhaps taking one's own life, and there are other mental health challenges that are similar, these are, of course, types of challenges that the rural mental health uh, pro pro portfolio is hard to roll out because of issues around accessibility, the travel that is entailed in turning in trying to receive services and the availability of very limited numbers of mental health professionals in these regions, as well as stigma associated with actually seeking mental health services, particularly in area and facilities that are recognized publicly as mental health facilities. Next, please. Uh, our, we have the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy, which is based at HRSA and which promotes better health care service in, throughout rural America, was established in 1987 and has really worked very hard in order to provide more services and supports to rural health populations, uh, both physical and you know, um, behavioral health challenges. In fact, uh, FORP, and I'm going to use that acronym from here on out, informs and advises the Federal Health and Human Services Department on matters that affect rural hospitals and healthcare. Also, they uh, do a great job of coordinating activities within the department in order to be able to provide enhanced rural healthcare and they maintain a national information clearinghouse. In addition, they work with federal, state, and local governments and individuals in your states, I'm sure, as well as private sector associations and foundations looking for solutions that will be able to address the rural healthcare problems and the scarcity of services. Next, please. This is the charge for for they help shape rural health policy. They work with state offices of rural health to promote health, rural health research. They also work and support our national advisory committee on rural health and human services. And they do voice concerns for rural hospitals, clinics, rural health care providers, and as you may know, you know, critical access hospitals, which are closing in many areas in the United States, in many rural areas, and they support. Uh, populations and uh, diversity and try to ensure equity in healthcare in rural areas. Next, please. The Office of the, for the Advancement of Telehealth is also located here at HRSA and at OAT. We promote telehealth technologies to ensure quality healthcare delivery, education, and health information services. We found, of course, and I that you're aware of this, uh, the, the critical value of telehealth in rural and remote areas that are lacking in sufficient healthcare services, including behavioral health care. So there's been quite a range of growth in the area of telehealth services. The OAT the program is very committed to expanding those services, and there are a lot of funds that are being dedicated at this time to increase access to behavioral health care in rural areas through the use of telehealth. Traditional telehealth models are where you have uh, you know, care delivered to a patient at a spoke or originating site from specialists who got a distant site is an older model, but there are increasingly new models to be able to do service delivery. Next, please. Next slide, please. Thank you. Okay, so the one of the um, more uh, recently funded and continuing programs and there was just a, a funding announcement about this program this spring, is the Evidence-Based Telehealth Network Program that's also under the auspices of FORC. And this program is extending 
expanding access to health services in many clinical areas, but behavioral health care is one of them, acute care and primary care as well. The awardees are actually required to provide direct-to-consumer telehealth services to patients within existing and about to be established or, current or will be established telehealth networks by partnering with local established healthcare facilities. So this is an opportunity for some care coordination with some local communities to work with the federally supported telehealth programs and also uh, achieve care for people in rural and frontier communities. In addition, you know, there's a, an extension opportunity through the funding that's offered by HRSA for extension of access to care in medically underserved areas and primary care to find health professional shortage areas, HIPSAs. So we are using this model at this time. This funding just closed, but it's a regular announcement that comes out usually, we think every year it'll continue to come out. So there are opportunities in the future to be able to potentially apply for this funding. Next, please. So HRSA, like SAMHSA, and so many parts of Health and Human Services are working together and initiating activities to address the opioid crisis. In particular, you know, prevention and access to treatment you know, for opioid addiction, the reversal of drugs and this avail their availability are critical to fighting the pandemic. The epidemic, excuse me, and the primary care settings have increasingly become a gateway to better care for individuals who have behavioral health and primary care needs. And of course, that brings us to the health centers that are funded and supported by HERSH. So we do our very best to support grantees. We have numerous resources and technical assistance, uh, venues, opportunities, and uh, providers who give training to integrate behavioral health care into practice settings that are in our health centers. Next, please. Thank you. So some of our efforts have been expanding access to health centers and other primary care settings to address more explicitly the opioid crisis, using telehealth to treat opioid use disorder, connecting stakeholders to opioid-related resources. And there's a, a very active exchange of best, best practices and regional approaches among HRSA-supported health centers and other health settings that has uh, helped to you know, have a lot of knowledge be gained that's being practices that are being shared. In addition, you know, we support the increased opioid use facility training in primary care. And we are doing everything we can to inform our policy and address opioid related poisonings and overdoses through our poison control centers, which are also funded through HRSA. Next, please. So the Rural Community Opioid Response Program is a particularly focused or targeted program for rural communities in, a, in addressing the opioid crisis. It's a multi-year initiative, FORP manages it and, award, and you know, competes the, um, the notice of funding opportunities for organizations to apply. And the goal is, in particular is to address those barriers that are difficult and particularly the areas that we start, that are being talked about here, rural and frontier, barriers to the treatment of substance use disorder and opioid use disorder. So there are five grant programs that you can find covered within the uh, opioid response program. And those are planning grants to be able to de determine what can be done locally, what the relationships can be done, what are the needs of the local population. And so are implementation grants, which can build on the original planning grants, medication-assisted treatment expansion grants, neonatal abstinence syndrome grants to work with pregnant mothers, and psychostimulant support. Now, these are all grant programs that are funded through the Rural Communities Opioid Response Program. Next, please. In addition, just to give you a sense of the scope of the ARC Corp, uh, we, fund, we fund three rural centers of excellence on substance use disorders. You know, if you go to that link, you'll find a lot of great materials that you can use. There's a technical assistance portal. And you can see that the impact on rural communities includes an investment of almost $300 million since fiscal year 2018, since uh, October of that, of that year. And it will be over 1,420 counties that have been touched by those funds and supports. Next, please. 
talk a little bit about rural behavioral health workforce uh, centers. And I want to talk a little bit about workforce because it's actually very key to increasing access, as we all know. Um, you know, part of the rural communities of the response program, our course is, is also the rural behavioral health workforce centers, which is an initiative that we have in place to also help reduce morbidity and mortality resulting from SUD and OUD in high risk rural communities. And we do uh, we support these behavioral health workforce centers to advance the overarching goals of the R Core initiative and to help train and educate health professionals in rural areas to be able to provide care for individuals with behavioral health disorders. Next, please. Integrated behavioral health results. Uh, this is a very direct link to our health centers, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But obviously, integrated behavioral health results are becoming, you know, the model for. We have a safety net type of approach, and of course, at HRSA, and we also have a uh, all and all entry uh, opportunities for people to come in for services that would maybe be stri strictly behavioral health, or they may be seeking the primary health care at the health centers, and then be directed to behavioral health uh, care either that's already at the facility or perhaps through referral. And so executive providers, you know, we're using several models to achieve this level of integration. And, you know, there are a number of care manager models, behavioral health clinician brief interventions are being instituted and other models that will help integrate more fully behavioral and primary health care staff. Next, please. HRSA has a no wrong door approach, as I mentioned, to behavioral health services. And the health green, the healthcare teams at the health centers can provide screening, they provide direct services and referrals to systems of care that are focused on addressing behavioral health concerns. The advantages that we've seen is that by having individuals go to healthcare centers, that reduces to some extent stigma and discrimination that may be associated with seeking services for behavioral health issues in areas where they are known to be providing those services, perhaps in rural and frontier areas. Uh, there's some costs associated in terms of reduction of costs, and of course, we believe that this promotes an improved patient outcome. Next, please. The health centers provide both mental health and substance use services. These are a, a list of our health center services. We, we screen for mental health and substance use disorders. We do developmental screens. There, is, there are counseling and psychiatry facilities uh, to, uh, capabilities available at many of our health centers. We have 24-hour crisis intervention, and of course, medication-assisted treatment for substance use disorders and detoxification. Next, please. Thank you. We also uh, are doing a good deal of work on initiating, well, I should say, integrating behavioral health with primary medical care in school-based service sites, which gives, provides a point of connection uh, early on with early identification with children who are perhaps um, at risk for behavioral health concerns or substance use concerns. Uh, the, in fiscal year 2021, the school-based service sites funding was awarded for health center program award recipients competitively. And that, uh, that funding is to expand access to health center services by increasing the number of students who access their health services through the, the schools where there is healthcare service delivery. And the goal here is to have this expanded to include a complement of behavioral health work. And of course, the schools can be located in rural uh, and underserved areas. So it provides a point where youth, children and youth can get help with mental health and substance use disorder issues uh, and also be able to not leave the community, which can be a significant challenge to receipt of care. Next, please. Just to give you a sense of the volume that we're talking about in 2019, um, the, the health centers served over almost 12, had completed almost 12 million mental health visits. There were more than 13,542 behavioral health FTEs placed in various health centers in the United States, and that included psychiatrists, psychologists, substance use disorder specialists, and social workers. This, this gives you just a sense of the reach that we have. So mental health patients or individuals who came in with that concern particularly increased uh, you know, a good 26% from 2017 to 2019 in terms of receipt of care through health centers. 
and depression screenings are also increased, as you can see. So approximately 96% of our health centers provide some behavioral health services. Next slide, please. I wanted to share this because of those of you who work, uh, I didn't, because of our limited time, I didn't get a chance to talk too much about the Maternal Child and Health Program, but the, the Bureau of Maternal Child Health does a tremendous amount of work in behavioral health activities uh, to ensure the health and well-being of children and their mothers and also uh, women who are pregnant. So one of their right ongoing initiatives right now is around suicide prevention and basically the Emergency Medical Services for Children program, which is, uh, does very, very good work in developing programs around the needs of medical health services for children in many underserved areas is, is focusing more and more of their funding and, and, and their activities and their program activities on mental health emergencies. And you'll see here that there's a, you know, a, prepared, a one pager that's being prepared, it's already been prepared, and there's also a behavioral health collaborative that's going to be beginning in 2022 with our state partnership grantees. In addition, there are regular podcasts about screening for suicide and the emergency department and what the emergency department should do if someone screens positively for suicide. Next, please. The Bureau of uh, Health Workforce is what I mentioned earlier. That I wanted to talk a little bit about workforce. Basically, the Behavioral Health Workforce Center, Research Center is strengthening the workforce responsible for preventing and treating our, uh, you know, individuals who have mental you know, health and substance use disorders and conduct studies to inform workforce development and planning efforts at federal, state, and local levels. And of course, uh, we do a lot of modeling around workforce. The 21st Century Cures Act mandated that HRSA study the workforce uh, for the nation around mental health and substance use disorder. Okay, so uh, the you can take a look at the health workforce simulation model that was used by HRSA to meet this mandate. Next, please. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, which is, you know, helping our policymakers and our stakeholders make decisions around what kind of education, training, delivery of care is needed with the behavioral health workforce to serve underserved areas. And this is, you know, during the opioid crisis, we are continually analyzing the size and distribution of the workforce and monitoring current patterns as part of our predictions, especially to determine future supply and demand. Next slide, please. I won't go into these numbers, but that, just to give you this so that you can look at it later, this gives you uh, our projections right now for 2030. That won't help us today, obviously, 2021, but, okay, so we have some data here that you can take a look at. You might be interested in seeing this. Next slide, please. And there's more of those data. Next slide, please. And here are some resources I welcome you to look at. We have many, many resources available for your community and information about our activities. Thank you very much for the this opportunity to share with you today. Sophia, thank you. Um, this is Charlie Smith. Um, I'm the regional administrator for SAMHSA, um, affectionately known as SAMHSA, but we're the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. Uh, and in my capacity, I uh, oversee mental health and substance use services in the states of Colorado, Montana, North and South Dakota, Utah, Wyoming, and 33 tribal organizations and nations that are in that territory. Um, a quick shout out to, to Kitty and Jody and the rest of um, uh, the National Academy, thank you very much for inviting us and we're really thrilled to at least kind of start today and ho hopefully kind of continue the conversation with regard to how SAMHSA, along with HRSA and other HHS partners can really help all of you think about um, your approaches to addressing mental health and more broadly behavioral health crises kind of going forward. Uh, next slide, please. So um, just to uh, echo a little bit of what Sylvia kind of kicked off, uh, this is a slide from our National Survey on Drug Use and Health. Um, yes, I will have quite a few pictures in my slides uh, and I'll probably talk around them, um, but uh, we had roughly 61 million individuals last year. So not including 2020, uh, but 2019 uh, that identified as having a serious mental illness and or a um, substance use disorder. Um, really to kind of take note, um, this, this data has actually been holding fairly true. However, uh, given the 2020 data, which we anticipate will be published this coming September, we anticipate likely some changes given the pandemic and the impact of the pandemic across the country. 
That being said, it kind of really speaks to how mental health and substance use really begin to present itself within our communities. And also take note, when we think about crises, crises for mental health include substance use, but also for those who may be struggling with both. Uh, and so somebody may be feeling suicidal while um, intoxicated or high on some type of drugs or having some significant um, substance use disorder. So I think it's just what I want to point out to the fact that we want to think about crises um, in the larger sphere rather than just thinking about them concerning mental health. Next slide, please. So this kind of drills down a little bit uh, more to what a crises look like from a data perspective. Uh, for this region. So my region is actually highlighted in red. Um, you can actually see substantial increases in suicides. Uh, roughly five out of the six states uh, in that area have experienced significant increases in suicides um, over the last 10 years. What's notable about this region uh, is that we are the region in highest in the country for suicide. Um, so four out of the six states are in the top 10 for suicide, death by suicide, and has been the case for roughly the last 10 plus years. There are a variety of different factors that go into it, one of which is access to care. Um, and access to care includes what is our crisis response system and how best can we as states and local communities and the nation be best uh, responsive to those individuals in need. Next slide, please. So uh, a little bit about SAMHSA. Um, SAMHSA is the uh, lead federal agency for mental health and substance use uh, for the country. We actually cover the entire age spectrum from birth to death, as well as the entire service spectrum. So thinking about prevention, uh, intervention, treatment, as well as recovery. And some of those elements are actually reflected in the right-hand side of, of the screen. But most importantly, our mission is to reduce the impact of mental health and substance use on America's communities. And we do it through leadership and voice and uh, data collection surveillance, some of which is actually merged very nicely with HRSA. And then HRSA's data really informs a lot of what we do. Uh, but this is not alone. So we're operating conjunctively with the CDC, National Institute of Health, and so forth to really kind of paint that picture of what um, mental health and substance use look like for our communities. We're involved in public education, a lot of regulation, practice improvement, uh, and I'll get to this in a moment. Yes, we have a plethora of resources to include uh, grants, um, very complimentary of HRSA's uh, substantial influence uh, in the healthcare delivery system. Our tagline typically is behavioral health is essential to health. I see this as bi-directional. So health is tremendously impactful on our behavioral health. Prevention works, intervention is critical, treatment is effective and people recover. And as I talk a little bit more, think about this intervention section as where our crisis delivery system really sits. Next slide, please. Um, SAMHSA's priorities, which um, may be influenced by the incoming administration as we get kind of ramped up with an assistant secretary, uh, which we hope to be confirmed relatively shortly, but we're very much focused on the opioid crisis as we have been for several years. We're definitely focused on serious mental illness and serious emotional disturbances. Uh, really wanna make sure that the audience understands there is a difference. Uh, so children who are struggling uh, with serious mental illness fall into this category known as serious emotional disturbances. And then for adults and older, older adults, we typically classify them as a, in the category of serious mental illness. And there's some differences, and we definitely want to make sure that our crisis delivery system is uniquely responsive to the needs of children, families, youth, and young adults, which needs to be thought of as different than how our crisis system responds to individuals who are adults and older adults. And I would argue that older adults also need a unique lens by which we respond to crises. Um, we're focused on advancing broader prevention, treatment, and recovery for a variety of mental health and substance use issues. Opioids is a big issue, but for my region, opioids is the fourth most frequently used um, drug resulting in drug treatment. Alcohol, marijuana, and methamphetamine lead this region with regard to serious um, substance use disorder issues, including crises. Uh, so be mindful. It's not just opioids. It's a multitude of um, uh, substances that could cause problems. Uh, we're focused on data and we're also focused uh, really in alignment with where HERSA is going with regard to our healthcare practitioner training and education and much of our activity dovetails uh, and supports uh, HERSA's leadership in this area. Next slide, please. Um, so SAMHSA, I, I think a lot of what you're probably interested in, okay, where's the money? 
Um, a lot of SAMHSA's infrastructure that goes to the communities, goes to the communities and states through the form of formula grants, otherwise known as block grants. Um, the two big ones that go to every one of the states as well as territories in the country are known as substance abuse prevention treatment block grant, and then the community mental health services block grants. I'll speak a little bit more about them, particularly as we've seen increases in funding in both of those block grants. But that is your bread and butter for uh, federally funded state administered mental health and substance use services to include crisis related services. In addition, there, there are a couple of other formula grants focused on um, homelessness for individuals with serious mental illness, as well as a kind of a, a civil legal protection for individuals with major psychiatric disorders, uh, which is number D or letter D. And then finally, probably many of you are familiar with the significant investment by the federal government to address opioids for both states and tribes. And those are known as the state opioid response grants and tribal opioid response grants. So in addition to those formula grants, which quite honestly reflect like roughly 70% of SAMHSA's total budget, um, and roughly another 30% are delivered by SAMHSA through the form of discretionary grants. And it covers the entire gamut, so that uh, the age um, gamut in the sense from birth to death, as well as the entire treatment, um, prevention and treatment and recovery section. These are just some examples. I think we put out over 500 grant, different grants per year, but many of them are focused either directly in the area of crisis or indirectly in the area of crisis, that could be an opportunity for you in your health policy work to think about working with your state agencies and potentially uh, community agencies to blend and braid these uh, funding opportunities while discretionary to implant more crisis services. Um, we have funded the Garrett Lee Smith Suicide Prevention um, uh, crisis grants of which there are three different types for the last 15 years, and that is a bit of a backbone for SAMHSA's uh, suicide specific crisis investment. I do want to take note, there has not been substantial investment by the federal government to address suicide for adults. Uh, it was not until two years ago that the federal government even addressed grant opportunities for suicide for adults. It's been almost exclusively in children and youth. Um, however, that is beginning to change given the data I mentioned before. Next slide, please. In addition to grants, um, SAMHSA also um, puts out an, an awful lot of technical assistance and training. This is a hard slide to read. Uh, you're welcome to kind of see these, um, uh, this screenshot actually on SAMHSA's uh, website. Um, but we have a variety of technical assistance and training centers that are all for free for anybody. And so these, these training and technical assistance centers are not designed specifically for a grant or group of grantees, but they really provide a center of excellence, a hub, a clearinghouse, a place that can provide training, webinars, consultation uh, to you in your work within your communities uh, to look at a variety of different topics, which you can see of the variety there. But we have some such as the Suicide Prevention Resource Center, otherwise known as SPARC, which works specifically with your state suicide prevention directors and your state mental health authorities to build more robust and nuanced um, suicide prevention um, infrastructure. In addition, um, next slide, please. Uh, I wanted to kind of highlight um, 10, um, there are 10 regions and within each of the 10 regions, this, this gets complicated, within each of the 10 regions, there are three centers of excellence funded by SAMHSA, one in substance abuse prevention, one in substance abuse treatment, and one in serious mental illness. Um, this slide actually shows each of the 10 regions it earmarks each of the serious mental illness or mental health technology transfer centers that are your centers of excellence for your respective states in the respective region. So in the light blue in the middle is region eight and at the University of North Dakota, along with the Western Interstate Commission on Higher Education, which actually Sylvia noted one of their publications in her slides, that center of excellence stands up all activities to include uh, crisis work for the states in that region for individuals with mental health issues. And so they can be a hub and a resource for you. Uh, and if you need more information regarding who those points of contact are, uh, feel free to reach back to me or we can get you that information uh, through your leadership. Next slide, please. 
Um, wanted to note a couple of different things, which I do think are exciting, particularly with regard to this conversation. Uh, given the um, COVID supplemental funding out of the Budget Consolidation Act, which was signed at the end of December, there was a substantial increase to SAMHSA's funding, uh, which really targeted um, the block grants. Uh, so actually in the middle of that listing, it's $1.65 billion went into the Community Mental Health Services block grant and another $1.65 billion went into the Substance Abuse Prevention and Treatment block grant to begin to make a significant investment. Um, I have not seen this, having worked in the field for 30 years, have not seen this level of investment into behavioral health uh, in that time. And so this is a tremendously exciting opportunity. In addition, there's been substantial uh, increases in funding for our integrated care, which is the first line CCPHCs, suicide prevention, emergency response. So more funding really dedicated to this area, this topic of crisis services. Next slide. So as much as that may have been an initial um, uh, party that we had uh, as a federal government. It was followed up by the American Rescue Plan, which again made a substantial investment into SAMHSA's block grants, which then get filtered to each of the states. Uh, roughly $3 billion are now coming um, to the states in addition to the 1.65 that I mentioned earlier, again with a substantial focus on our crisis service infrastructure. Within these funds, there is a 5% set aside specifically targeting the crisis service infrastructure in each of those states. And states are now working with SAMHSA to lay out some of their initial thoughts with regard to how best to build um, and direct crisis services so we are able to reach individuals much more effectively in a streamlined way to really mitigate individuals either not getting care or ending up more deep in the, in the system than, the, than is truly needed. And then sadly, unfortunately, a high rate of individuals in crisis end up in our legal system, which has become for years, as many of you have heard, a bit of a default of our psychiatric care system. This is a way to kind of curtail that and really right size behavioral health care as part of the healthcare system from a crisis, uh, as well as a therapeutic uh, lens. Next slide, please. So following this up, uh, this past year, SAMHSA published uh, for the first time a set of standards for crisis care. Um, and these standards um, are fairly broad. Uh, they kind of fall into three large areas. Um, and as our center director for Center for Mental Health Services, Dr. Anita Everett talks about, she mentions each of the three areas are someone to talk to, some place, someone who can respond, and then some place to go. And really what's behind each of those is that we need a fully functioning 24 seven national, regional and local um, call line. Uh, we do have a national lifeline, which has been substantially um, utilized over the last 10 plus years, uh, particularly during COVID, we've seen an over 300% increase in the number of calls, but we still know that roughly 40% of those calls that come in end up not getting received partly because of the gaps in the system. One of the things that has been built as a response to that gap is with the FCC and SAMHSA, um, there will be going live in July of 2022, a new national mental health suicide crisis line or lifeline, otherwise known as 988. This is a complement to the existing 911 system that will be specifically targeted for individuals with behavioral health crisis. As you can imagine, this heavy lift is involving many different uh, agencies with great attention by the current administration to really begin moving through the infrastructure, the planning, the planning, then the infrastructure development, then how best can our commercial uh, lines and telephone companies be able to support it? How can our local systems be able to support uh, the activities and then the workforce to actually back up and, and stand up the appropriate uh, 24 seven call lines and as well as complimentary uh, warm lines where individuals in crisis can actually talk to somebody. Secondarily to that crisis infrastructure is mobile crisis teams. And that's kind of the, someone who can respond. And thinking about these mobile crisis teams, they have been managed by law enforcement. And unfortunately that has kind of positioned any with a mental health or substance use disorder is seen as a uh, criminal justice case. And we want to move away from that system entirely and actually stand up and build out uh, the appropriate response as treating it as a healthcare condition for someone in crisis, 
um, and then being able to move that person directly to care and then that directly to care is appropriate crisis stabilization. Next slide. Hi, Charlie. Um, yep. This is me. I just wanted to um, give you a minute notice so that yep. I have some time for questions. Absolutely. I'm going to fly through this. So integrated care, CCPHC, lots of funding going into this system. We can talk more about that. Next slide. Uh, there's a lot of funding in this space, 365 current grantees and several hundred more coming online. Next slide. Um, we talked about this, so we introduced it. Next slide. Um, and then finally, if I was to throw in my crystal ball, a little bit of kind of thinking forward, think very clearly in, in my world as in mental health and substance use from a rural lens, emotional health and wellness is critical. We've seen that in the pandemic. Access to care, equally critical. We need to be thinking about team-based integrated converted healthcare systems. Technology is a big player, recovery support system. People need education, people need housing, people need social connectivity, and then finally workforce. That's the engine that makes this entire system work. Let me stop there and kind of hand it back, uh, I think to Jody at this point. So Kitty, thank you for the thank work. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you to both Sylvia and Charlie. That was extremely helpful. And I think the, the complicated and the and the volume of complicated information uh, that was just shared with you really speaks to why at the National Academy for State Health Policy, um, we decided to put together this policy academy opportunity. There's so much happening at a federal level. Um, there's so much happening with both policy and with funding. Um, and we would like to offer an opportunity to help states figure out how to navigate all of that, particularly for your rural populations. Next slide. So just a bit about the goals of the Policy Academy. Uh, what we're really looking to do is, is to help you do some peer-to-peer -peer learning, um, to share the strategies that have worked for you, that are working for you, um, to, to be able to look at those systems in a holistic way alongside other states, um, to be able to look for commonalities between you and other states, uh, and also to look for ways to, to maybe think innovatively and, and to look at ways um, that you may be able to, to pull in some outside the box thinking alongside one another. Um, Nashby really uh, does intend to serve as a resource to you to be able to, to find folks like Sylvia and Charlie to share information, um, to find resources from other states, and to convene folks together to help make those connections for you um, and to help provide those deep dives into policy um, that, that are, are harder to do, I think, when you're within a state. Um, so that's really where we're coming from, helping you identify and share those strategies, helping you come to solutions. Um, and really develop some concrete policy strategies using your state's policy levers um, to make those changes happen for rural mental health crisis services. Next slide. So just a, a, some of the basics about the Policy Academy. Um, Nashville has run several of these in the past. Perhaps you've been a part of them before. So some of this may be uh, repeated news, uh, but we really are looking for up to five state teams. Um, five is a pretty manageable number for you all to be able to share information and for us to be able to convene you. Um, so five state teams will be selected. Each of those teams will be composed of up to five members, um, no more than five. Uh, and we do ask that representation on those teams, at least two of those folks are senior state officials. Um, so two folks from state agencies in leadership positions with decision-making authority on the team. We encourage you to have uh, other state staff as well as stakeholders as part of that team as well um, to make sure that we're getting kind of the, the perspective of all folks who are involved in these decisions. Um, we'll do 12 months of targeted technical assistance. Um, that's gonna look like monthly meetings. Um, so monthly kind of check-ins between us and you in which you'll have the opportunity to go over a work plan that we'll develop with you, ask us any questions, um, ask us for resources, resources, ask us to do deep dives into policy um, where you may be running into barriers. There will also be um, collaborative learning engagements. So things like webinars with the other teams, um, hopefully some in-person meetings where we're not sure where that stands right now and, and we'll navigate that alongside you. Uh, so there may be some site visits and, and we usually try to do one or two in-person meetings where we can bring everyone together. Um, so we'll, we're gonna, we're gonna cross our fingers on that. I'm not sure where we are on that just yet. Um, but just for some key dates, the applications themselves are due July 9th. So that's a few weeks away. Um, 
we will spend about two weeks uh, reviewing those and selecting teams and we'll notify teams by the 23rd. And then the Policy Academy itself does not actually begin um, in 29-21, in that's 2021, there's a typo there. We're not gonna make you wait 900 years. Um, so the Policy Academy will begin at the end of this summer and we'll run through the end of next summer. Next slide. Uh, just to give you a, a little bit of a background on, on what it may look like, what the actual work may look like, um, we'll be doing an analysis of this of your particular state policy environment. Um, so that'll include your regulatory barriers, legislative issues, just all of all of those things that kind of come together to make these difficult to navigate. Um, we'll put together state specific action plans alongside you. Um, and you you will have the opportunity to, to learn from your peers as well as as from us. Um, hopefully we can connect you to, to all of the people who can provide that information. Um, again, it's a year of individualized technical support. Um, those monthly calls are what we'll absolutely schedule, but we can certainly do some ad hoc support for you as well. Um, you'll also have assistance in developing those work plans. So as you start to put those together and you realize where there may be gaps, um, you realize where uh, you may feel like you have strengths that you really want to draw out um, and leverage. Um, and then also those collaborative learning engagements with other states um, that we'll do throughout the Policy Academy. Next slide. The components of the application um, are pretty straightforward. Uh, of course, the, the required components are going to be the state team members um, that that needs to be completed with the two senior state officials and then some other folks as you see fit. Um, and those things should align to what your needs are. You know, you know what stakeholders you need at the table to make these decisions and we leave that decision to you. Um, and then we'll do a, a detailed outline on that application of your needs and your goals to make sure that we can align to what those things are. Um, and we'll also look for states that have kind of similar needs, but also different needs um, so that we can make sure that we've got the balance across teams. There are optional letters of support. Um, you're welcome to provide those, particularly from your Medicaid and behavioral health agencies in your state. Uh, those are not required, um, but, but they are optional and you're welcome to include them. Next slide. Uh, just a, a little bit on the timeline and the process, um, putting together the team and completing the application is the first step. Those applications do need to be sent to us, um, to Mia Antezo, who's also on the call. Her email address is there. It's also linked within the application. Um, those will be, need to be sent by COB Eastern Time, so 5 p.m. Eastern Time on Friday the 9th. And states will be notified uh, no later than July 23rd. Um, it is a, a relatively simple application. If you've had the chance to look at it, there are really just a, a few questions. It's a high level look. Um, we do ask you to rank your needs as well, um, but this isn't something that we want to be onerous for you or something that you, you spend a whole lot of time and energy on. Um, we, we just wanna see kind of the high level of what it is that you need and make sure that we can provide that. But, all right, at this point, we can open it up for questions from you all. We wanna make sure that we have time to address any issues that have arisen if, as you've started to look at this application or put this together. Um, so I'm not sure if we have open lines or if we're doing that through the chat, I think probably through chat. All right, how competitive do we anticipate the process to be? Um, Kindy, do you wanna take that or do you want me to answer that? Um, I Happy to have you weigh in, Jody. I mean, I think we always, um, well, we typically have more um, applications than spots. Um, I think this is a particularly timely issue for states, as we heard from um, Dr. Fisher and Dr. Smith. There's a lot going on here, so um, it's it's you know we never quite know what we're going to get, but I think this is this is a pretty intense topic right now. Yeah, I would agree with Kitty that um, I think there probably is a lot of interest around this topic and, and hopefully um, we can select a cohort of states that we feel can be helpful to one another and we can be helpful to. Um, so I think that, that about wraps that up. Do states that have any Medicaid waivers in place have any more or less to address in terms of application or consideration? Um, I would say no. I think that, that 
your Medicaid landscape is certainly a component of your application. And those are things that you would want to outline at a high level within your application. Um, but I don't think that you need to, you don't need to provide um, any sort of attachments or any sort of addenda that outline those things. So mention those things, don't feel like you need to go into heavy detail. Other questions from folks? I wonder um, a question to folks who are participating in the call, um, if you want to weigh in by chat or, or, or verbally, um, in how your states are viewing, <clears throat> are viewing uh, travel at this point. You know, we in years past have been able to, as Jody mentioned, convene folks, and I think there's some real value in that. Um, but I'm just wondering if anyone wants to weigh in on whether their state is thinking about travel. <laughs> Most people, it, it seems like it's open. There are no rental cars. That's absolutely true. Mm. So it sounds like there's an openness to travel, which is good to hear. And we will we will navigate that individually with state teams. Um, you know, your comfort level is important to us, certainly. Um, I do see a couple more questions. There's one in the Q and A. Um, will there be more than one team of five states selected? Um, I think this is this is asking essentially about cohorts. No, there will there will only be one cohort um, of five states with with five individuals on them. So this will be, this will be just kind of one round. Um, that's a good question. Uh, in terms of barriers, so if we have Medicaid state plan, licensing, state licensing, regs and rules, MCOs, et cetera, that are the framework that is part of the barriers, is that the type of thing we should consider for mentioning in applications? Yes. Those are precisely um, those are precisely the components that I think construct that framework for you. Those are also uh, the areas where it feels like we probably have um, the most expertise to be helpful. Um, we are we are a team of very pure policy-minded people, uh, and all of those things are very pure policy things. So I would definitely say if you wanted to provide within your application kind of an outline of what those barriers are, even if it's just a quick um, bulleted list doesn't have to be super extensive, but that's the kind of thing that would help us figure out what it is that, that we can provide to you. No problem. Other questions from folks? Kitty, anything else that you feel like we should address that we maybe missed? I don't think so. I think those were some, some great questions. Yeah, and these are, um, if you haven't participated in something like this before, I will just put in the plug. Um, these are, these are a fun opportunity. Um, in addition to, to getting to do a lot of learning, it's a really good way to meet other folks and, and learn new things. Um, I've been fortunate to be on both sides of these, uh, both as a, as a state team member and at Nashby, um, and they're always really great learning opportunities. So we certainly look forward to your applications. If you have questions between now and then, um, any of, our, any of our emails are open to you. I would encourage you to reach out, ask questions via email, give us a call. Um, we, are, we are here for your success, so we're happy to help um, answer any questions that arise between now and then. Anything else from you, Kitty? Nothing from me. Um, and just would like to uh, thank Charlie and Sylvia for their participation and their great information. We really um, appreciate their time and um, all, of the, all of the great stuff that they brought to this discussion. So thank you both very much. Absolutely. We will post the slides and a recording um, of the webinar up on Nashby's site. 
Um, we will also be putting together a document that answers any questions that maybe come in through email or any other frequently asked questions that we have on engagements like this. So those things will be posted for you very likely early next week. But again, please feel free to reach out. We want to be helpful. All right. Thanks so much, y'all. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.